It's Valentine's Day weekend, so I thought now would be the perfect time to talk about my top 10 classic screwball comedies. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Cobwebs channel where we're dusting off old movies. My name is Daniel, and before I get into my top 10, let's talk a little bit about what is a screwball comedy. It's a subgenre of the romantic comedy and ends up being somewhat of a spoof or satire of love. They're often battle of the sexes movies in which the woman takes often a more dominant role in the relationship and the man's masculinity gets somewhat challenged. And they're usually categorized by a lot of zany misadventures in, in, involving things like a lot of love, misunderstandings, fake marriages, false identities, and just a lot of just wackiness. They end up being a lot goofier than a traditional romantic comedy, and they got very popular during the Hayes Code specifically, where uh, more overt sexuality often had to be replaced by just misunderstandings, quirky bickering, and a lot of just silliness. And I happen to love these movies. And we're going to be talking about the movies from 1934, ascribing to the theory that Frank Capra's It Happened One Night kicked off the screwball comedy through roughly the early 1940s. So while there are films after this period that exist as screwball comedies, What's Up Doc comes most to mind. Those are very much homages to this classic era. And that classic era is what we're talking about today. We are not counting musicals. And there are two movies that maybe sort of exist as honorable mentions, but I wanted to know they often get put on to best screwball comedy list, but I personally don't agree that they fit in there. And that's the Philadelphia story, which I believe is just a traditional romantic comedy and the thin man, which is a murder mystery detective movie with some screwball elements, but I believe fits into that first genre a bit more. So now that we've got those two movies out of the way, let's talk about my top 10 and please leave your top 10 or however many you want to in the comments down below so we can talk about these movies. At number 10 is The Awful Truth from 1937, directed by Leo McCary. Unfounded suspicions lead a married couple, played by Cary Grant and Irene Dunn, to separate and begin divorce proceedings, whereupon they start sneakily undermining each other's attempts to find new romance. The Awful Truth is often considered the quintessential example of exactly what a screwball comedy is. It's very much a battle of the sexes movie where Cary Grant sort of gets what he wants from Irene Dunn during the first first half from doing a lot of sneaking and then Irene Dunn completely turns the tables on him in the second half and turns everything back on him which is so much fun to watch. It's also an example of a comedy of remarriage in which characters start out married, break up, and spend the movie having to get back together. Hollywood often used this trope during the Hays Code to get some more overt adult themes into movies that they wouldn't be able to do if the couple wasn't technically married from the start. I don't love this movie movie quite as much as everybody else does. The presence of Ralph Bellamy with Cary Grant ends up making me think of a better movie that's going to come up on this list later, and I don't think that Cary Grant became truly great in this genre until the next year, but this movie belongs to Irene Dunn. She is hilarious in the movie. She completely owns the film, and she's the reason that although I don't love it as much as everybody else, it still makes my list at number 10. At number 9 is definitely a more obscure movie than my 10, and that is The More the Merrier from 1943, directed by George Stevens. Due to a severe housing shortage in Washington, D.C., Connie, played by Jean Arthur, offers to sublet half of her apartment out of patriotic duty. Instead of the female roommate she expects, she gets the mischievous old Mr. Dingle, played by Charles Coburn, who then promptly sublets half of his half to young Joe Carter, played by Joel McRae, creating a cramped and hilarious living situation. First thing I have to say about this one is Charles Coburn is awesome in this movie. He is hilarious to watch as this this very mischievous but good-hearted old man who's constantly manipulating everyone around him to get whatever he happens to want out of any given situation. He's by far my favorite thing about the movie, but Gene Arthur is adorable in the film, and Joel McRae is kind of a revelation in this. I'm not used to seeing him used as such a cool sex symbol. He's often used as a little bit of a square, but he's ridiculously cool in this movie and makes a phenomenal couple with Gene Arthur. And I was also really surprised how much sexuality this movie was able to sneak in, particularly of a scene of Gene Arthur and Joel McRae sitting on a stoop in front of her house. Crazy that that got through in a Hayes Code film. The More the Merrier is a little longer than most of these movies, and sometimes you can feel it, but it's an incredibly fun and romantic film and is the latest screwball comedy that actually appears on this list. My number eight is a light and silly romp, and that's Vivacious Lady from 1938, 
also directed by George Stevens. On a quick trip to the city, young university professor Peter Morgan, played by Jimmy Stewart, falls in love with nightclub performer Francie Brent, played by Ginger Rogers, and marries her after a whirlwind romance. But when he gets back home, he can't bring himself to tell his conservative and respected family about it. Here's an example of a screwball trope of secret marriage, which the movie uses to get a lot of mileage out of is some intensity of how far is Jimmy Stewart willing to go to not tell his family about his marriage and how much is Ginger Rogers going to put up with it. A lot of zany antics, misunderstandings come out of this, so it's a perfect example of a screwball. And Jimmy Stewart and Ginger Rogers have ridiculous amount of chemistry on screen. Most actresses tend to have great chemistry with Jimmy Stewart. He's just such a phenomenal actor. But I'm a particularly a huge fan of Ginger Rogers. I have more to say about her later on this list. And I was just, because I'd never seen them in a movie before, I was just kind of shocked. It seems like they should have a dozen movies together. This is also a screwball comedy that uses class conflict quite a bit, which is a theme that you'll see pop up in this genre time and time again. My number seven is definitely a respected classic, and that is My Man Godfrey from 1937, directed by Gregory LaCava. A Fifth Avenue socialite played by Carol Lombard needs a forgotten man, which is an unemployed and homeless man due to the Great Depression, to win a scavenger hunt, and she finds Godfrey, played by William Powell, who resides in a dump by the East River. She hires him as a servant for her unhinged family, and as she falls in love with her new butler, Godfrey turns the tables and teaches the family a lesson or two. Here we've got an example of more class conflict as a theme in a screwball comedy, but I think this one takes it further and ends up being a full-on social commentary film about the Great Depression and about the Forgotten Man, which is something talked about very much in this time period. It's also an example of a screwball comedy where I think the screwball elements end up being way more important than the romance. While I don't find myself caring a great deal in this movie about whether the main couple is going to end up together, it's an incredibly funny movie and the comedy elements end up overtaking everything for better, I think. And William Powell is just He's one of the coolest actors to ever live. He's so cool and so excellent in this movie. Definitely the highlight of the film. My number six is an overlooked classic to me, and that is Bachelor Mother from 1939, directed by Garson Kanan. A department store clerk played by Ginger Rogers is mistakenly presumed to be the mother of an abandoned baby. Outraged at Polly's confused and unmotherly conduct, the rich and handsome son of the store owner, David Niven, becomes determined to keep the single women and her baby together. So Ginger Rogers is actually my favorite actress of the 1930s. I know she's not necessarily the most iconic or the most critically acclaimed, but she's my favorite. She's a brilliantly talented triple threat that is so charming, beautiful, but incredibly funny. I think she's one of the funniest actors of her time. It does not get credit for that nearly enough. She's incredibly headstrong and just so much fun to watch. This movie is a great example of what makes her so great, such a showcase for Ginger Rogers, and David Niven ends up being a really good pairing for her, because this is a rare time when David Niven can kind of let his stuffy hair down and just be really fun and funny in a movie, and he really pulls it off, better than I would have guessed, honestly. The premise is a perfect example of what the Hayes Code produced, because it seems clear that they wanted to make a movie about a single mother making her the lead of a romantic comedy, which is a great idea, but because of the Hayes Code, she couldn't actually be the mother and be unmarried. So she ends up having to find the baby, be mistaken to be the mother. But that element they have to put into the movie makes it a perfect screwball comedy because that allows a lot of wacky misunderstandings and antics to get into the film, which makes it much funnier and just such a fun watch. Breaking into the top five, it's the movie that a lot of people believe started it all, and that's It Happened One Night, 1934, directed by the iconic Frank Capra. A renegade reporter played by Clark Gable and a dissatisfied young heiress played by Claudette Colbert meet on a bus headed for New York and end up stuck with each other when the bus leaves them behind. We're talking about the Hayes Code a lot in this video, and that's because it had such an impact on the screwball comedy genre. And this movie is an interesting example in the history of the Hays Code because this film comes out right on the line where they're having to obey it but slightly not as much as before. Scenes of passion as they called it in this time could not be depicted in the film which ended up being a bit of a problem for a romantic comedy about a couple who ends up spending a lot of time together alone 
and have to even spend the night in the same room. So what's the solution to this? The Walls of Jericho, which ended up possibly being the most iconic part of the movie where Clark Gable hangs up a sheet between them in the room where they're staying the night and calls it the Walls of Jericho in which each of them cannot cross. This might be the most influential film of all time to the romantic comedy genre. Practically all rom-coms you watch have been impacted by It Happened One Night. And according to some friends of mine who have recently watched it for the first time, it still holds up to this day. My number four is a personal favorite of mine, even though it's not as iconic as some movies that have already shown up on the list, and that's Libeled Lady from 1936, directed by Jack Conway. When a major newspaper accuses a wealthy socialite played by Myrna Loy of being a homewrecker, she files a multi-million dollar libel lawsuit, and the publication's frazzled head editor, played by Spencer Tracy, hires an old colleague, William Powell, to temporarily marry his own girlfriend, Jean Harlow, and then romance the Myrna Loy character until she is actually in the scandalous situation that she was accused of before. That might sound somewhat confusing, but it is, I think, a perfect, one of the best of all time, premises for romantic comedy, for a screwball comedy, because it just layers so many different levels of goofy, screwball, shenanigans, misunderstandings, mistaken identities. It has so much of what we love about this genre packed into one film. Now, of course, William Powell and Myrna Loy are perfect together. This is their best pairing outside of the Thin Man movies. Could even be argued it's their best pairing period. They are amazing in this movie. I just love them. But Jean Harlow might even steal the movie. She gets to really play it up because she's not actually the female lead of this movie. That goes to Myrna Loy. She very much gets to go into character actor mode and just be goofy, ridiculous, over the top, and it's such a joy to watch. But even though there's so many screwball comedy tropes in the movie, it actually avoids some of the more boring or uninteresting cliches of the rom-com genre. You can actually just see the movie jumping right over them and avoiding them entirely. And that's another thing, man, I just appreciate so much about Libeled Lady, one of my favorite movies on this list, one of the top movies that I encourage people to seek out if you haven't yet. My number three is a big one. You knew it was coming up on this list at some point, and that's His Girl Friday, 1940, directed by the incredible, one of my favorite directors of all time, Howard Hawks. Hildy, played by Rosalind Russell, the journalist former wife of newspaper editor Walter Burns, played by Cary Grant, visits his office to inform him that she's engaged and will be getting remarried the next day. Walter can't let that happen and frames the fiance for one thing after another to keep him temporarily held in jail jail while trying to steer Hildy into returning to her old job as his employee. So His Girl Friday is actually the second adaptation of the play The Front Page, but it makes the bold and frankly genius move to turn the Hildy Johnson character from a man into a woman so the movie can have an added screwball romantic comedy element to the film. This is perhaps the greatest example of a movie of rapid fire dialogue. This movie treats dialogue like a shootout in a John Woo movie. Like it is a marvel to watch, just to watch these characters talk on screen so fast, but so clear and delivering one iconic, brilliant and fascinating line after another. It is so much fun to watch. Gotta give a shout out to Ralph Bellamy as the quintessential good guy, but the wrong guy. His naive niceness, I think is a lot more charming in this movie than it is in The Awful Truth. One of the other reasons why I prefer this film to that film. And of course, Cary Grant is brilliant. I love watching Cary Grant in ultra professional mode that Howard Hawks often put him in as the perfect new newspaper professional who is scheming and kind of evil at times, but always incredibly charming to watch. Now, one reason this movie is as low as it is, because I think you could easily make the argument it's the best movie on the list, is I think it's less obviously an example of a screwball comedy than my top two or the movies that have come prior on this list, because it is very focused on actual newspaper business and in actually solving a mystery uh, with newspaper reporters. Uh, more focused on that than perhaps it is on screwball shenanigans or on romance for sure. But newspaper work kind of is how Hildy and Walter's romance works. So it kind of works for the movie. But like I hinted, my top two are the perfect examples of exactly what a screwball comedy is and what makes them great. So my number two is bringing up 
Baby from 1938, directed again by Howard Hawks. The film follows a very nervous and tightly wound paleontologist named David, played by Cary Grant once again, who is trying to obtain a million dollar grant for his museum. Along the way, he is constantly bumping into the very uninhibited and free-spirited Susan, played by Katherine Hepburn, who keeps dragging him along in her various misadventures, either by accident or eventually by design to keep him around. Shockingly, Bringing Up Baby was a flop when it was released, but now it is number 88 on the AFI's top movies of all time list. This movie is just a constant barrage of wacky misadventures, including Katherine Hepburn lying about Cary Grant so much he can't even keep it all straight, Katherine Hepburn losing her skirt and not even realizing it, so Cary Grant has to follow her around trying to cover it up, going to jail, dressing in drag, and eventually everything revolving around a leopard named Baby. This is one of the fastest moving and funniest comedies I have ever seen in my life. I can't even tell you how much I laugh during this movie every time I revisit it. It's so much fun. The actors are at the top of their game. Honestly, Cary Grant has never been better in this kind of role, just as a hapless, clueless guy who's being dragged along for this entire film. And Katherine Hepburn has just never been more funny or charming. She's one of those actresses that can do it all. She's played every kind of character. And this isn't the kind of movie she would normally make, but she's brilliant in this. Just one of the funniest comedy performances I've ever seen. But like most of the time when I make these lists, my number one was clear. I love this movie so much. It is The Lady Eve from 1941, directed by Preston Sturgis. A young, wealthy man named Charles, played by Henry Fonda, falls for Jean, Barbara Stanwyck, who is a con artist and has her sights set on Charles's fortune. But matters complicate when Jean actually starts falling for her mark, and when Charles suspects Jean is a gold digger and dumps her, fixated on revenge and still pining for the millionaire, she devises a plan to get back into Charles's life. With love and payback on her mind, she reintroduces herself to Charles, this time as an aristocrat named Lady Eve. This is directed by Preston Sturgis, actually one of the earliest writer-director auteurs in Hollywood, and I'm such a fan of him. He had such an incredible run of movies right around this time of one great film after another, but this one happens to be my very favorite. Unlike Cary Grant, this is absolutely not the kind of movie Henry Fonda would normally make, but Preston Sturgis really uses his all-American Boy Scout image to present him as very naive, and while Henry Fonda is unqualified to be in this kind of movie, that's really used well because his character is just so naive and hapless, he's unqualified to be in this situation. Barbara Stanwyck unequivocally owns this movie. She is so strong and funny and has this rock solid presence that guides everyone, but especially Henry Fonda through the movie. And she's the perfect pairing for Henry Fonda because he he's so like weak. He needs somebody strong to just lead him around and show him what he wants. And that's really what Barbara Stanwyck, that's how she exists in this movie. The Hayes Code initially rejected the script for this movie because it was too clear that the characters were actually having a sexual affair. So they had to rework it to get it through but I still think it's a remarkably sexy film for the 1940s, which makes us such an interesting example, once again in the history of the Hays Code, just one of the most fun, funny, and romantic rom-coms and screwball comedies to ever be made. And yeah, my personal favorite screwball comedy, not just of this era, but of all time. So that's it, everyone, my top 10 screwball comedies of all time. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't yet, please leave a comment below and let me know what your favorite screwball comedies are. If you enjoyed this video, would appreciate a like and a subscribe because we've got more classic film talk on the way, including Blu-ray reviews, more top 10 lists, and more. Thank you so much, everybody. I will see you next time.